and either people are going to um, jump on like they have right now. Um, I know it's harder when it's dark outside <laughs> after work. So we'll let people join as they can. Um, but welcome everybody. This is uh, unit three, session three of the ACES Aware Ventura County virtual lecture series. We're so glad you're here with us. Um, we are, um, we're going to, like I said, we're going to be recording, actually we already started recording. Um, so you will be able to access um, the recording on the ACES Aware Ventura County website. Um, if you haven't already, feel free to put your name and organization in the chat just so we know who has attended. I think this is kind of standard already, but make sure your microphones are muted as we move into our presentation. And um, like always, which is exciting, uh, we are doing a drawing for a custom Aces Aware Ventura County prize for everyone who is in, atten in attendance. Uh, we will announce the drawing winner in our session follow-up email, so be on the lookout for that. Um, email from ACES Aware of Ventura County. And then um, in your registration evaluate and evaluation, please, please make sure you note whether you are requesting um, continuing education. And for those of you who are seeking CEUs, you must be present for the entire session and complete the evaluation to receive those credits. Um, again, you are welcome to introduce yourself. And um, as before we begin, we'll hear a few words from Dr. Landon. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session that is part of the AAVC Provider Training Lecture Series. We hope this session is both informative and engaging for you. Don't forget to register and complete the evaluation so we know who our audience is and how to improve in the future. All who register, including those who are watching this as a recording, will be entered into a raffle for a special ACES Aware of Ventura County Prize. This lecture is being recorded so you can have access to it on our website at any time. Thank you for joining us on our mission to bring better help, better health, and better hope to Ventura County and beyond. Love that catchphrase. So our speaker today, we're very excited to have Dr. Joy Chodzinski presenting on the community resiliency model. And this is an introduction to that model. And um, Dr. Chazinski is a clinical psychologist specializing in addiction treatment and trauma for individuals and couples. In addition, she provides clinical trainings for mental health professionals on top, topics of substance abuse, um, substance use, sorry, trauma and mental health assessment and treatment. She's also an assistant clinical professor at UCLA Center for Behavioral and Addiction Medicine in the Department of Family Medicine. Uh, she provides short-term evidence-based treatments for a range of psychological and substance use disorders with the, within the primary care setting. She earned her doctorate in clinical psychology from Pepperdine University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Cedar sinai Medical Center, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences, where she specialized in cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy. Her areas of expertise include substance abuse, trauma, motivational interviewing, the neurobiology of drug abuse, CBT and DBT interventions, and co-occurring -occur disorders. After the lecture, Dr. Joy will be responding to your questions, so keep those in mind as we go through the presentation. We will encourage you to submit those questions via the chat box when it comes time uh, for the Q&A session. And with that, I'll turn it over to our presentation. Thank you for that introduction. Yes, today we are gonna talk about the community resiliency model. Just a brief overview and introduction, and this is a model created by Elaine miller Karras, who is a licensed clinical social worker. And I am going to just provide you with an overview of this model and how it can help us learn how to manage stress. So learning objectives for today, is to really highlight the understanding of our biology and our nervous system and how we can use that to shift understanding about trauma and stress as biology um, and not mental weakness. The connection, number two, we'll talk about the connection between 
the importance of this biological model and how it can help people understand and heal from ACEs. And then we'll also learn about the wellness skills and how to use them to regulate their, your nervous system. I really tell people that once I learned these skills, I teach them to anybody who will listen, and I think we could put them in the water. They're really basic life skills that just help us get through. Get through the last 18 months, get through the day, get through stress. So in order to start, I wanted to just ask you a couple questions to think about what or who uplifts you? What or who gives you strength? And what or who helps you get through hard times? As, as we are thinking about those questions, I want to invite you to take a resiliency pause. And what that is, it just means we get quiet for a second. And resiliency pauses can help us bring balance back to our, our body and our mind. Um, a resiliency pause just means get quiet and think about who or what uplifts you and helps you through hard times. Because as you'll see in a second, when we can think about that, just those thoughts can help regulate our nervous system. So here's the definition of resiliency from Elaine miller Karras, who is the person who founded this model. Resiliency is an individual's and a community's ability to identify and use individual and collective strengths in living fully with compassion in the present moment and to thrive while managing the activities of daily living. So this model comes out of a lot of biological research and models before it that say, hey, our bodies keep a hold of the things that have happened to us. And if we can understand that and learn how to regulate ourselves, we can get through the day. A lot easier sometimes than than before. So this model invites us to look at a perspective shift in how we use how we view and used to view trauma and and treatment for trauma. So conventionally, a long time ago, it would be people are bad, they need to be punished, people just don't care, we need to stop making excuses, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And the question would be, what's wrong with you? Why are you behaving that way? That doesn't feel good. It doesn't even feel good to read that question like, or that, that card like that. So then we move to more trauma informed. Yes, people are suffering. We need to have some effective interventions. Many people care, but lack understanding and then don't know what to do. And we need to learn how trauma impacts child and adolescence development. So the question then becomes, what happened to you? So I can look at the behaviors and, and whatever's happening is sort of what happened that caused you to um, behave in this way, that there's a reason, there's more under the surface. And the resiliency informed perspective is people are resilient and they need our compassion as they learn new skills to help get through daily life. Any person can learn self-regulation skills that are based on science, that are literally based on biology. And we need to learn these skills of well-being to reduce suffering. And so we ask the questions, what's right with you? And what are your strengths? And you'll see how these questions are important in helping people to realize what they do have. What else is also true? So what we're going to talk about today is the community resiliency model, which is a set of six wellness skills to help regulate your nervous system. I love this model because you can use it across the lifespan. We use it with babies to help regulate them and definitely teach it to children and anybody else who will listen across all cultures and people with different literacy abilities. We all have access to the language of our biology. 
and a framework to help understand the human experience. And that's really what this model does is just really help us learn, hey, we all have the same nervous system that works generally in the same way. So if we can listen to pay, start to pay attention to what it's telling us, there's some tricks to help it learn to regulate. So key concepts one, this is a biological model. So what that means is it's all about what happens in our body. So we all have something called a resilient zone and it's not an actual place in your body, but it's just sort of a con concept to think about. We call it a resilient zone or the okay zone. And when we're inside the two lines of these two blue lines, it's when you feel most like yourself. It doesn't necessarily mean you're in a good mood or a bad mood. It just means you feel regulated. You feel mostly calm and most like yourself. And what can happen is this within the resilient zone, within those two lines, we can have all sorts of thoughts, feelings, emotions. So for example, I can feel tired, maybe like a little kind of down in, in, the, in my resilient zone, but I'm not so tired that I can't move and I can't engage and I can't do anything. And on the other end, I can feel angry but still be in my resilient zone. So that might mean I'm angry and I know it, but I don't get so angry that I start yelling and screaming and, and acting in a way that's more out of control where I feel like I'm not in control of, what, of what's happening. So the goal is that we want to try and stay in our resilient zone. But what happens is that purple lightning bolt over there some kind of stressor or event. Now this could be a traumatic event. It could be an earthquake, um, an assault that had happened, something from the past, something current. And it can also be, you know, a near miss of a car accident or something like that. Something's gonna happen that's gonna bump us out. It can even be a, somebody's tone of voice that's gonna bump us out of our zone. And so what happens when we go and we get bumped out of our zone, we call it being bumped high or bumped into the high zone. You see that box up there, you get edgy, irritable, your body reacts in a way that prepares you for fight or flight. And so what's happening is you're starting to notice maybe you're anxious, you're angry, you're having a lot of worry thoughts or negative thoughts you're bumped into the high zone. You probably notice too in your, in your body, you might get hot, your heart's beating fast. You might have shortness of breath. Your body's preparing for fight or flight. Now, at the same time, we have the low zone, which is sort of the other end of this, which is more depression or sadness, feeling just kind of zombie-like or with withdrawn, kind of offline. You might feel like you want to isolate. You might be exhausted or really tired, or sometimes just numb. Now we all have these bumps into the high zone and down into the low zone. There's nothing unusual about that. What happens though sometimes is depending on how we're built, our experiences in the past, how we've managed stress before, how we were raised, sometimes we might get bumped up into the high zone and then drop down into the low zone and back up into the high. And so we have this back and forth or we have this bumped up into the high zone and then you get stuck. And so for example, let's say you have a, a difficult interaction in the morning and you get bumped up into the high zone and you're just angry and you're upset. Now the whole rest of your day, if you're operating from the high zone, everything's harder because your body is in fight or flight. You're not, and when we are in fight or flight, our frontal lobes here that are responsible for thinking and reasoning and judgment and making decisions, those really get turned down. In some cases they get turned off and everything that's motivating us is survival brain. That sort of 
biological survival brain of am I surviving or not? And so what we want to do is notice that one, the resilient zone's a thing. And what's it like for you to be in your resilient zone? How do you know when you're in it? And then how do you know when you're bumped high and when you're bumped low? And the skills that we talk about today are what helps us once we recognize we're bumped out or we're getting bumped out, how do you learn to regulate so you can kind of come back in and feel more settled? The other thing that we know with this is depending on our previous experiences, our resilient zone can be different widths. So for example, if we're talking about a, a person who had a lot of uh, adverse experiences when they were a child, their resilient zone might be very narrow and it may not take a lot for them to get bumped out and for their nervous system to be dysregulated. And they may not even know why it's happening. The good news is that when we practice these skills and when we start to notice that, that this is happening, every time we use a skill and help our nervous system feel better, we're widening our resilient zone. So then it takes less and less to bump us out. So just paying attention to our autom autonomic nervous system is important. And you don't have to worry about the, the names of it, but basically the sympathetic nervous system prepares for action. So when we are going into the high, bumped up into the high zone, your breathing rate, heart rate, blood pressure, all increases. Stress hormones are released in your brain. You start to sweat because your body's getting ready. Am I going to fight this threat or flee? And digestion and saliva decrease because your body doesn't need that at the moment. It needs to be able to, to fight. The parasympathetic prepares us to rest and to relax. So what decreases? Everything that just increased over there, breathing, heart rate, all of that comes down and digestion and saliva comes back online because your body's, okay, the threat's over, now we can relax. So why am I telling you this? Because this is important when we're starting to track what's happening in our body and you can start to notice, huh, why is my heart beating so fast? I don't know what's going on. Maybe that's what you notice. Oh, maybe you're getting bumped out a little bit. Why am I so hot? Okay, maybe I want to use a skill to just sort of regulate a little bit. Then guess what? You'll notice your parasympathetic takes over and you might take a deeper breath. You might notice your heart rate decreases. You might also notice stomach, stomach gurgling or burping because your digestion has come back on. Big part of this model is just starting to pay attention to our nervous systems and what happens in our body. So when we think about the community resiliency model, you can think about the laws of nature in that there's a natural rhythm in nature and that rhythm also exists within our nervous system. And we don't really learn this or we don't really think about our bodies in this way, but we don't have to be trapped in the storm. And the storm being sensations of pain or discomfort, we can learn to draw our attention to sensations of well-being so we can feel better. It doesn't have to last forever. And this is part of how we train ourselves to notice what else is also true. So maybe you've heard the term neuroplasticity, meaning the lifelong capacity that our brains can change and rewire themselves. We didn't used to think that this could happen, but thank goodness it can because it's great news. Remember, that if things happen to us in the past and we have a narrow resilient zone, our brains are wired in a way to process stimuli differently. Well, learning some skills to help regulate your nervous system literally creates new pathways in the brain so you can learn different ways to manage these experiences. You've seen this before the slide about positive, tolerable, and toxic stress. And as a review, the positive stresses, those stresses that we have in our lives and we face, and they don't let leave a lasting effect, a tough test at school or a game. 
you're able, your body's able to recover pretty quickly. A tolerable stress is something that maybe you don't want it to happen. It's a natural disaster. It's very stressful, but your body can usually buffer the effects and with support of a caregiver or therapy or other interventions, you manage the stress and get through it. And then the toxic stress is just that, the stress that is just there and dangerous to us. It's prolonged, it keeps going on and we can't get away from it. And this is the stress that changes our brains when we're young and can lead to psychological and, and um, other health related problems as we grow. You've probably also seen the three realms of, of ACEs. When it just started out, it was the, the household stressors, things that could happen when you're a child that are um, adverse experiences. And the more of these you had, the higher likelihood that you would have some or could have some physical or mental health problems as, as an adult. And so because of the world that we live in, this has expanded. So down at the bottom of the roots is our community. And what happens in our community that affects us, that's stressful, that is traumatic. And three is with the environment, the climate crisis, the pandemic, natural disasters. All of these things have an impact on us and our developing brains when we're young and our adult brains when we're older about how we impact, or excuse me, how we process information and things that happen to us. We just need to know that this is a thing and then use the CRIM skills to be able to help manage our, our nervous systems. I like to think of toxic stress as something that is too much, too fast, something that happened too quickly, too little, too long, think more like neglect, and too much for too long, some sort of abuse that you couldn't get out of or a situation, bullying, something like that. That your system, it just overwhelmed your body's ability to cope. So the community resiliency model has six main skills. And we're gonna focus on the basic three. This is an iChill app that I'll talk more about at the end, but um, the, the founder, um, Elaine miller Karras developed the app and it's free and it's got everything that we'll talk about today, the help now skills there on the left for people that need a reminder, that wanna review a little bit more. You can tell your patients about it. You can tell everybody about it. This is a way to just sort of start helping with people learning some skills to feel a little bit better maybe if they can't get into treatment right away. It also is fully in Spanish as well. So the first skill is tracking and that's reading sensations in the body. It's really the foundation to help us learn how to stabilize our nervous system. And it means paying attention to sensations in the body in the present moment. So sometimes this is difficult because we don't really learn how to do this. There's different ways that we can find out or, or be aware of what's happening to us. So we think, we know, what am I thinking about? And we know maybe how we feel, the door over there on the right. But the sensing part is what we're talking about in this model really starting to notice, okay, if I'm feeling angry, where do I sense that in my body? What's that sensation? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it tingly? Is it fire? And if I don't like that, how can I move away from that to a place that feels better? That act helps us regulate our nervous system. What we pay attention to grows. So I have this continual shoulder pain. If I keep paying attention to that, what happens? It grows. I'm very aware of the shoulder pain. But what else is also true? 
the rest of me feels pretty good. So if I can put my attention to something that feels better or more neutral, then that helps this helps alleviate this a little bit or notice helps me and train my brain notice not everything hurts. So there's scientific research that says this is more about the neural pathways that are, are being created. Brain cells that fire together, wire together. So every time you use a skill that helps your nervous system to regulate, helps you feel more calm, your brain is making a pathway that says, oh, well, we can do this again. And the more you practice it, the more, the easier it gets. Very briefly, interoception is something that is your body's ability or your brain's ability to sort of sense what's happening, bodily sensations that are happening in, that cause us to act. So, for example, if you are outside and it's, you're hot, your body is sensing, okay, I'm hot, I'm going to go to the shade. You're not necessarily thinking that, but the insula is the part of your brain that's sending messages of like, I don't feel good. I've got to be able to regulate. This is what this model is tapping into. What are you noticing in your body and what do you need to do about it? I love this study. They asked a, a lot of people um, to self-report when they feel these different emotions, what sensations, where do they notice sensation in the body and what is this, the sensation? Because every one of our emotions has a physical experience in the body. So for example, you can see the red and the yellow is more hot and the blue is cool. So just have a look at that where you see like in anger, people report that they feel anger in their hands, their chest and their face. It's hot. As opposed to with depression, everything is just kind of more turned down or off, sort of more in the low zone. Just to show you that when we talk about, oh, I feel I'm hot. Yeah, I'm angry or I'm feeling blue. You know, these things are in our culture. We don't really think about necessarily where they come from. So when we start to learn about our sensations, we can start to tell the difference between distress and well-being. So for example, if my heart's beating really fast, is that because I'm excited or is that because I'm scared? Well, I don't know. But if I start to pay attention to it, then I can learn. Oh, no, no, no. This one, this is okay. I just, I just got back from a run. My heart should be beating fast. Okay. We have a choice in what we pay attention to. And this is so important for people who have experienced trauma and felt in so many cases that they didn't have a choice. Teaching them, we do have a choice on what we can pay attention to happening in our bodies. So the first skill of tracking is really just noticing what's happening in your body at the present moment. And you want to determine, do you like it? Do you not? Is it just okay? Is it pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? That's the first thing. Then sitting or staying with sensations that are pleasant or neutral. Now remember, if the sensation's unpleasant, let's move away from it. There's no need to stay there. Can we find a place that feels better? So questions to help you, curiosity questions. What do you notice on the inside? Are the sensations pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? So I'd like to just invite you to take a minute and just sort of see what you might notice happening on the inside with you. Just see if you're aware of any sensations. And this could even be something like maybe you notice you're hungry, you might have to use the bathroom, you might notice your temperature. And you can just ask yourself, is this pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? Here's a slide that helps us learn sensation words. Because again, we don't really think about what these are like or learn these as a way to describe what's happening with us. 
You can think about the vibration, size or position, temperature, pain. These are all just sort of indications on sensations that might be happening in your body. Now, when we're tracking, we're also tracking what's happening on the inside. What are the sensations that I notice? And we're also tracking nervous system release. So a release is a biological process that happens when the body releases stress energy and comes model, I think, because when you start to pay attention to that, it's kind of like this feedback system with your body of like, okay, yeah, we were a little stressed, but you know what? Now you're yawning and you stretched a little bit. You're doing okay. Paying attention to these release sensations helps you feel more regulated. And I just think this picture is really cool. Here's some release sensations. So heat or warmth or cooling down, tingling in your arms or your legs or your hands, shaking or trembling somewhere in your body, deeper breathing, crying or laughing, burping, gurgling with your stomach, itching, yawning, and hand movements. So what happens a lot is we do this and we don't even notice it. And we might do some of this, and then people have told us over the years, oh, stop moving your foot like that, or why are you yawning all the time? So it kind of gets to be socially not acceptable. These are things that are fine. This is our body trying to maintain some equilibrium. And so if you can just sort of start to notice that these things happen, it can help you notice what's happening with your nervous system. Just another slide to help you think about what's happening in your body when you're stressed. Maybe your breath is constricted, your heart's beating fast, your muscles are tense, there might be pain, or if you have pain, it's more severe, or maybe some numbness. And when you're feeling more resilient, you're breathing more deeply, your heart's beating regular, your muscles feel relaxed, you feel grounded or present with where you are and more calm. And then the release is the shaking or the trembling, the burping or yawning, and that's your sign that you're coming back into equilibrium. So the second skill is resourcing. And one of the best ways to learn how to track what's happening in your body is to think about a resource. So a resource is something that, like if you look at pe the people in this picture, what might be pleasant for them? They're laughing, they're smiling, maybe they're eating good food, they're together. A resource is something that when you think about it, it brings joy or it's pleasant. So it can be real or imagined, internal or external. So sometimes people will say, oh, there's nothing really that I can think of. Well, can you imagine something from a book or a, a, a character? And it can be internal or external, maybe something that you like, a, a vacation, a person, or something about yourself that when you think about it, it makes you feel pleasant or a, a, a sense of joy. And we, so I would invite you now to see if you can think about a resource. So again, something in your life that when you think about it, it brings joy person, place, thing, no right or wrong. And as you think about this thing, you can ask yourself some questions because we want to intensify this, meaning I want to see it like you do. And the more you can kind of see a clear picture of this memory in your mind, the easier it is to get a, a felt sense of what that's like, because we're going to notice what happens in our body. So for example, one of my resources is a vacation I took to Hawaii once. And I was by myself on the hot beach, the beautiful water, there were some surfers, big waves, 
I can really think about that and try to picture it, feel the heat, see the blue. What does it smell like? Really think about that and then notice, what do I notice on the inside? I notice that my breathing is... I notice that my breathing is more regulated. I feel warm. When you think about your resource, just really let yourself picture that. What do you notice on the inside? What sensations are you aware of? Is there warmth or coolness? Is it heavy or light? Tingling? And if it feels pleasant, just notice it more. If you don't like it, if it changes for whatever reason, just notice where you might feel a little better. Notice my deeper breath. That's my system regulating. And you can use this with kids. We, this, the community resiliency model is used with kids all the time. And there's specific um, materials around working with children. But asking children or teens resource-oriented questions like, who's your favorite friend? Tell me about your pet. And as you're asking them about that, watch what happens. They start to smile. If you ask my kids about their cat, they'll start to smile. And what does he do? They're resourcing. They're calling up that memory and thinking about it. And then I want to have, help them notice what that's like. No, what's that like? Notice your smile. What's happening on the inside? You feel warm, you feel cool. And just noticing those sensations helps the nervous system to regulate. So that's skill two, resourcing. Now skill three, grounding. And so some of you might have heard of grounding before, depending on if you practice yoga or meditation. And grounding within this model is defined by your body making contact with a supportive surface. And it helps bring you into the present moment. If we don't feel like our relationship to the earth is safe, then it's hard for us to develop other relationships. When we're grounded, we have a sense of being present in time and we're not worried about the past or the future. Think about how great that is and how hard that is to do sometimes. You can ground in many different positions. So you can walk, laying down, sitting still, ground through a part of your body, like putting your hand on the table and just noticing that your hand is on the table, standing against the wall. So I'd like to have, invite you to join me in a grounding exercise. You can just find a comfortable position. So you can stay sitting or you can lay on something more comfortable, stand up, walk. You can keep your eyes open or closed, whatever's comfortable for you. And just start by noticing where your body's making contact with a supportive surface. So you might notice where your feet are touching the ground. And just notice that they're touching the ground. And where your legs are sitting on a chair. Where your back is supported. Maybe notice where your body is touching itself with your hands on your legs or if your fingers are interlaced. And as you notice these places that your body's making contact with something supportive, just check in with your breathing. See what you notice, your muscle tension, your heart rate. And as you notice your body making contact with these supportive surfaces, 
Just see if you can scan your body and notice any pleasant or neutral sensations on the inside. If you find something that's unpleasant or doesn't feel good, see if you can shift your attention and find something that feels better. And as we get ready to end, just scan your body one more time and notice any of those places you have a pleasant or neutral sensation. So that's a grounding exercise and it probably took us maybe three minutes or so. Um, something that you can do whenever as you practice it, sometimes before bed, sometimes just noticing my body making contact with something will be enough to help regulate your nervous system a little bit. And it's a skill that you can practice. So that's grounding. So those are the top, there's the I chill app again, because I think it's great. Um, those are the main three components of the CRIM skills. You track your body, notice the sensations, moving towards pleasant sensations helps you to regulate your nervous system. Think of a resource and those pleasant sensations that come up around that and grounding, noticing your body making contact with a supportive surface. So another really important part of this model is help now skills. And these were developed because sometimes your body, you might get bumped out of your zone pretty quickly and not really feel like you have time or be able to think about your resource or have the time to do a three minute grounding exercise, but you need help now because you need to come back into your resilient zone. That's what we'll talk about next. Help now or reset now, reset the nervous system. I just love this picture, the, the Trauma Resource Institute who is the body that um, encompasses these models came up with this. And I think it's just a cool picture that has the, the help now skills, but we'll talk about each one of them separately. So these are strategies when you're stuck in the high zone or the low zone, and they can help you get back into the resilient zone. And they're also on the app. Drink a glass of water, juice, or tea. Now, if you have any of these or you want to do these while we're going through them, yes, I really recommend it. And if not now, then trying them um, when, when we're done here, or when you have some time to just really see what works for you. They might not all work, um, but usually people find one or two that really work for them that they can use again and again. And so we're not just chugging the water or juice, but you want to take a sip and notice the sensation as it goes down. And that act of noticing it is distracting you from whatever's happening. And it's also helping your nervous system regulate. Touch a surface. And now you're thinking, this is a grounding. You're thinking, is it hard, soft, rough? You're noticing it. Your attention is going to your hand on the table or your hand on the glass or your foot making contact with the floor and really noticing what are the sensations that you notice there. And as you're doing these, you're looking for those release sensations. Like, are you taking a deeper breath? Do you feel like you want to stretch a little bit or move? Did you yawn? Those are all good signs. Look around the room, pay attention to anything that catches your eye. So I'd encourage you to do that now. Just take a look around the room and describe something that you see that catches your attention. You just notice what happens on the inside as you do that. Now, if you're not particularly bumped out, you might not notice anything, or you might notice you take a deeper breath, 
Or you want to move a little bit. This one's my personal favorite. Name six colors that you can see right now. Or sometimes I've changed this to um, with my kids when they're young. Can you find the colors of the rainbow? Let's look around right now and find the colors of the rainbow. It can literally stop a fit in its tracks. Where are the colors? Can you find them? Because it's distracting and you see the <gasps> deep breath happen. That's the nervous system regulating. So the frontal lobes, can come back online and then we can have a conversation about what's happening. I use this one a lot. Count backwards from 20. You can even count backwards from 20 while you're walking to add it. Sometimes people like to move. I've had people tell me, Joy, I can't sit still and do all of these. Okay, let's get up and move. Can you notice your feet on the floor as you're walking? Count backwards then. You can notice the temperature of the room or the space. And you're really sensing into it. If, it. if you like it, notice it. Oh, it's cold in here. Okay, yeah, I'm cold. And you're waiting for those releases that shows you your body's coming back into equilibrium. Notice the sounds within the room or outside. What do you hear? Walk around make your walk around the room or outside. Notice that your feet are making contact, really paying attention to those steps. And pushing. So pushing your hands, like at the bottom picture there, pushing your hands against the wall, like you're really trying to push over that wall for five or so seconds. Push, 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 and then step back and take, it, take a minute. What happens? Probably take a deeper breath. Check in with your body. What sensations do you notice? Maybe you have to do it again. For people that don't like to push this way, you can do more of, of what's in that second picture there of just standing against the wall and pushing your hips against the wall. It's engaging your major muscle groups, which with doing that helps your nervous system to relax. Pushing. You'll notice your, your, your system will regulate. You'll usually take a deeper breath and you can think more clearly. So the help now skills are used when you need to reset more quickly. Sometimes they work more quickly than the resourcing or the gesture, or excuse me, or the, the grounding. Skill four is gesturing and spontaneous movements. So this is kind of cool because this helps you to pay attention to things that you probably already do that are soothing that maybe you haven't really thought about or you haven't noticed. So gesturing is some movement that we make of our body or limbs that emphasizes an idea or a feeling or an attitude. And usually or often we're not aware of them. So as you see her there sort of hand on the heart is a pretty common one. Gestures can be protective, joyful, powerful. And the idea here is that if we pay attention to a gesture that we're making and it's a self-soothing gesture, it can regulate our nervous system and make us feel better. So calming gestures, maybe playing with a ring, hand on the heart. Sometimes people play with their hair. I've had patients who just sort of rub their their thigh or a piece of their clothing, the couch. And you're just asking, just notice when you're making that gesture, you can even slow it down. And just really put your attention there. See what you notice on the inside. That's what helps our nervous system to regulate. Some spiritual gestures with praying, really put hands together. Just noticing that can help people notice what else is true. What else is happening where they feel better in their body. And the last skill is shift and stay. So what this means is shifting from distress to well-being. You already know how to do it. 
if you are scanning your body or if you notice there's something that's happening, some sensation that's happening that you don't like, where do you feel better? What else is also true? So if you have a headache and it just keeps going and going, when you can ask yourself, well, where is there a place in your body that feels better than your head right now? Yeah, my feet. Okay, put your attention on your feet. What's happening with your feet? What sensations do you notice with your feet? Are they warm, cool? And shifting your attention to somewhere that feels better and just hanging out there, stay there. You don't have to go back to the headache. Just notice my feet are better and you can start. Sometimes you have to redirect yourself. This comes up a lot. I notice at bed in bed, bedtime when people have trouble sleeping of can you start to notice instead of all of those thoughts about I'm not sleeping and why am I not sleeping? I'm going to be so tired tomorrow. Start thinking about your where does your body feel better? Noticing your body making contact with the, the, the bed or the pillow. So just to summarize what we've talked about with the wellness skills is community resiliency model is a way to help us pay attention to our bodies and track our nervous system so we can identify sensations. And if we find that we're feeling distress, shift to resourcing, thinking about something that when you think about it, it brings joy or pleasure and really notice what do you notice on the inside when you think of that? Grounding, noticing your body making contact with some supportive surface and really putting your attention there. Sense into it. We have to pay attention to things for about 13 seconds for them to really get downloaded up there. The help now skills, you can use those. Help bring you back into equilibrium. You notice the gesture that you might be making even hand on your heart or playing with the necklace and noticing pleasant or neutral sensations. You don't have to stay in the distress. So the, the, the last thing that I want to say is what we know is just like with anything, the more you kind of know about these and practice these skills, like know a couple resources or your go-to resource, your go-to help now skills, the easier they are to access when you really need them. So I'd invite you to just have a look at the app, have a look at what we talked about today and say, which one of these do I want to try? And can I just notice what's happening on the inside? And it might even be that it's hard at first to notice what a sensation is. And so you can spend some time there just sort of noticing, well, how do I know when I'm hungry? How do I know when I'm in my resilient zone? What's that like? What is relax? feel like on the inside. There's the Trauma Resource Institute on Facebook, Twitter. Um, Elaine has a podcast. Um, they are everywhere and there are trainings if you're interested in learning more about it. Thank you so much for your time. I think that was a perfect presentation for a Wednesday evening heading into the holidays. It's very good to kind of be grounded a little bit. So thank you, Dr. Joy, for that very informative presentation. Uh, I'm gonna read a few reminders about the ACES training certification and screening before we get to our Q&A section of the evening. And I usually read a slide, so hang on a second. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry, we're not doing that. We're going to go right into the Q&A session. So we're going to go right into the Q&A section of this presentation. I was losing track of which presentation I was on. So you're encouraged to submit your questions via the chat box um, for, the, for uh, Dr. Joy. Um, you're also welcome to use the raise your hand function, um, which is under reactions on the bottom of your screen. Um, and then we'll can call on you and then you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. So, and again, as we go on, feel free to continue writing any questions that you may have in the chat box. With that, let's get started for the, on the uh, question and answer session. Hi everyone. Happy Wednesday night. I'm surprised you're awake. 
after I watched that whole thing and I kind of was sleepy. <laughs> okay, Judith, there's a question in the chat. Let's yes, see. there is. So she's asking if you could explain. You're going to do this for me. This is great. <laughs> yes, what you meant about tingling body sensation. Um, okay, what do I mean about it? Could you explain what you meant about tingling body sensation? Yes. So as we're learning to even pay attention to the sensations that we have on the inside, one of them can be tingling and it can be people experience it like in their hands. I mean, all over hands, feet, it can be pleasant or unpleasant or neutral for people. That's why we ask them, do you like it? Do you not? Um, or is it just okay? And and sometimes it's sort of the sensation of like, there's something happening in my hands. Sometimes it's the release of some of the energy that's been stuck there for a while. Um, and the main point is if people are, are reporting tingling or if you're noticing it yourself, we kind of just want to ask, is it pleasant, unpleasant or neutral? And if it's pleasant or neutral, we'd invite you to notice it and sort of notice how it changes. And that just noticing, like kind of tuning into that sensation helps regulate your nervous system. If it's unpleasant or you don't like it or other people don't like it, then invite them to move away to a place that might feel better. Did I answer the question well enough? It's really different. I mean, we all have sensations, but the way that people experience them and the sensations that they experience are just different for everyone. I I, I could probably explain a little bit more. I have this, I think it's a tingling, but it almost feels like an electrical uh, sensation. It goes from my elbows, up both of my arms, and then crosses my chest. It used to not cross my chest. It used to just go up my arms and up my legs. Sometimes it hits just in the lower part of my legs and it only lasts for like seconds. But I've, okay. been to, but I've been to a neurologist and the neurologist said, nah, you don't seem to have anything going on with your nerves, you know, that's significant, but it's really irritating. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and, and so I don't know if that's what you're talking. I mean, trying to, I'm, you know, in the place where I'm trying to figure out what's going on with my body. And right. it's, an, it's kind of a nice idea to think that I'm trying to release something. Mm -hmm. Because then that's a positive thing, even though it's an unpleasant experience. Right, right, right. I don't know if there's something physically wrong with me too, so. Right, right. And I, I'm, I'm not a physician, so I, I don't know either. And what I would say is, you know, as you're noticing that, and it sounds like you're saying it's, it's unpleasant, you don't like it. I do, you could try some of the, well, where is it not tingling? Or where does your body feel better? Okay. And trying to put your attention there or that, or that could be a time you could think of the resource and notice like, okay, the tingling's there, but I also notice, for instance, a warmth in my heart or my head feels lighter or something like that, or something more neutral or pleasant and really trying to focus in on that to see if that helps. It might not make it go away, but maybe it it could make it a little bit less or a little bit more tolerable. Sure. It also sure. could be what you, what you mentioned, if it is a release of something, I mean, if you're noticing that it happens, like after you're kind of bumped out either way, high or low, um, sometimes this, the, the releases are important to know because we think that there's something wrong with us or we try to stop it. So if you can think about it, like, okay, I'm getting rid of the bad energy or the, the stuck energy is a better way to say it. Then sometimes that's sort of more more palatable. Sure. sure. Okay. okay. Thank you, Judith, for that question. I see Dr. Shaw uh, kind of unmuted herself. Do you have a question? Oh, I didn't realize I unmuted myself, but I was thinking that this sounds a lot like mindfulness techniques and just kind of tracking where you are, noticing what you're experiencing non judgmentally and learning to train your mind where it goes. Mm hmm. You know, I, I, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of similarity, similarities. And one of the um, practitioners who actually does a lot of the research on the CRIM model describes it as sort of like a body mindfulness. And what I would say, what sets it apart a little bit from the mindfulness is the um, two things, the, 
the focus on the sensory, like where, what are the sensations, sort of, you know, the heavy, the light, the warm, the cold, that kind of thing. And the choice of if you don't like it and you don't like what you're experiencing or what you're feeling, that you can move away from it. And sometimes with the mindfulness or the meditation, it's like, okay, sit there and sit in it and it will pass and notice that it will pass. That's fine. And also you have a choice of if you don't like this, you could do something else and notice how that's better. There's definitely lots of similarities. Great. And then is it Shira? I saw you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I did some work about 15 years ago with a gal out of Boulder, Colorado called Sensory Motor Psychotherapy. I can't mm -hmm. remember the name at the mo moment. Joy, maybe you're, you know her maybe name. Maybe Pat Ogden? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think she was the one that started this movement. And she always referred to the first chart that you showed with the ups and downs of of uh, stress, she called it the window of tolerance. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. I was just um, involved in a training, like a three day training for the therapist model of this. And the window of tolerance came up a lot in that. And well, first to say, Pat Ogden is definitely has contributed to this literature for sure. Um, and the window of tolerance, Elaine, who, who started this model, said, you know, yeah, it's very similar. I just don't like to think of the being in the zone as something that we have to tolerate. I think she thinks of it more as something like when we're in the zone, this is where we can really live and have that vitality of life and be able to feel the most like ourselves. Um, the concept's very similar, but that's the, the big difference that she sees in the model. Right. And I see Kathleen made a comment about that saying, I like zone of resilience more than window of tolerance as far as the sound of it. Thank you, Kathleen, yeah. for that comment. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Again, feel free to put it in the chat if, or if you'd like to raise your hand, pop on screen, unmute yourself. Those are all options. And I do have a question that came to me, which is um, I'm one that I'm actually very interested in myself as well, because I work in the school setting. Um, and, and you mentioned that this um, model has been used for young children as well. And you know, I, I think you said there's some separate literature and materials for young children. But do you see the community resiliency model working within a school setting? Um, as these may be some beneficial skill sets for kids, especially now after they're coming back from distance learning. And, and a lot of kids actually are having a lot of social emotional um, challenges coming back into school. Do you see this fitting into the school settings at all? Absolutely. It, it's in a lot of school okay. settings right now across the country and even in other countries because we know that we can start teaching little ones. That they have a nervous system too and they need to know how to regulate it. So there is something, and I think I mentioned it in the, in the video, the C learning program, S-E-E -E learning and it's through Emory University and um, in partnership, maybe is the way to say it, with the, uh, the Dalai Lama around how do we help build more resilient kids. And they have, I think you put your name in and you can get all of these materials and, and um, information for free. Um, that, and a, a section of it is these CRIM skills for teaching it to kids. And we have cool things like, games to teach it to kids, different ways to kind of approach to teach them about sensations. We teach them about the resilient zone. Sometimes in classrooms, they'll put up the resilient zone and sort of the whole class learns about it. And they'll say like, hey, Sharon, I think you're bumped out of your zone. Maybe you need to go do a skill. And they'll have the skills up. So they kind of, where they can, really try to integrate it into the classroom. Absolutely. It's, I, I do, I, I think it's helpful for everyone. I'm going to check that out because that's yeah. <laughs> I'm in it yeah. right now. So I'm like, yo, yeah. those are great. Great tips. Yep. Yep. Wonderful. Um, I think we might have time for one more question if anybody has something burning for Dr. Joy. Oh, Shira, go ahead. <laughs> well, if nobody else has one, I, this isn't really a question, but I just want to add to this uh, that Hakomi Psychotherapy, H A K O M I, is centered in Berkeley, California, and it's body-centered psychotherapy. 
And it, uh, I took several years of it and it's very much tuned into this as well, looking for micro movements and uh, going, following those movements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, thank you for that. I'll look into it. Um, I, I haven't heard of that particular one and I, I probably mentioned it in the video, but one of the things that I really liked about this model, I was learning, you know, I'm doing therapy and sort of getting to a place where I've just stuck with a lot of clients, sort of like, how do we get past this, just the cognitive part of it and consulted with a um, old professor of mine from Pepperdine. And he's what was well into the somatic experiencing training. Um, it's a long three-year training that you can do. And I, and I was like, I don't have time for a three-year training or money. I can't do that. He's like, check out these people over here. And he meant the community resiliency model because what she's done is taken the body centered therapies and tried to package it to make it just available to everyone. And so I'm sure that that's probably based in that. And what's different about this model than some of the other somatic experiencing, those are great if, for the kind of intense therapy. These are like skills that we're just throwing out, like try a skill, try a skill, you've got them um, for when we need them. Great. And I think that's a great way to end. I think this has been a very thoughtful presentation, great questions, very practical, I think very much um, useful kind of for things that are happening right now. So I hope everybody feels uh, like has a better understanding of the model. I know this was just an introduction to the model. So um, lots of tips on where else we can get more information. Oh, so thank you for everybody. Yeah, we will definitely checking it out. So thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, Dr. Joy, for your so uh, for being here and your presentation. Um, we are going to have a few reminders um, from the Landon Pediatric team um, coming up, and they will tell us also about some things that are coming up, uh, the next few lectures that are coming up soon. Great. Take care, everyone. Thank you again for watching this lecture. Remember to complete the registration and evaluation. We will contact you soon if you are one of our raffle winners, so stay tuned. Make sure to follow us on all our social media accounts and subscribe on our webpage for more information of our 12 lecture series, ACES Aware Ventura County, and all things ACES Aware. Thank you for joining us on our mission to bring better help, better health, and better hope to Ventura County and beyond. Bye. Bye. See you at our next session. And thank you everyone again. Uh, that concludes uh, our unit three sessions. So the upcoming uh, sessions that we have are unit four, which is the final unit of the ACES Aware Ventura County Virtual Lecture Series. Um, here are the final reminders uh, displayed on the screen. If you have any questions, of course, feel free to visit our website or email us. Um, and thank you again to Dr. Joy for that presentation and to Sharon for moderating um, this session and our Q&A. Um, so have a great evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. I know <laughs> it's the end of a workday and you want to relax, but thank you so much for sitting here and learning with us. Have a good night. <laughs>